the, the convention by endorsing organized deportation. Language also can be used or misused by well-intended advocates. We, con we continue to advocate a deficit-based advocacy rather than a strengths-based humanitarian approach for the plight of refugees and immigrants. We focus on the challenges of the people rather than this, their strengths to survive. For example, many in the policy, in policy world refer to burden sharing rather than responsibility sharing. I personally don't believe a human being is a burden to another human being. Advocates often fell prey to the tendencies to consider refugees and migrants as vulnerable, suffering, defenseless. I see them powerful, strong, determined to survive and sometimes to thrive against all odds. In my view, language matters. Dehumanizing people in the 1930s in Europe and the 90s in Rwanda started with a language of hate and then inhuman brutality continued. So for me, language matters. This reinforced the conception of uprooted people as weak, helpless, overlooking their many assets as well as denying their decision-making power. Harmful language and subjective leveling become institutionalized, making the inherent assumption more difficult to combat. Rather, the politicized language, they became assumed facts. International system of law and mobility management is in crisis. The current structure in place, including refugee camp management, practices, international status, and citizenship law, present a multitude of challenges, especially in Europe. Many nations, including the United States, and the founding signatories to the 91 Convention and the 1967 Protocol openly, openly disobeying the Convention and what they wrote. An institution that are involved in camp or migration management and service provision that can crit critique the prevailing refugee system are wary of doing so because challenging the status quo and the international arrangements could antagonize organizational survival. Therefore, many good intended organizations are putting institutional preservation over the best interest of refugees and migrants. For example, a con containment continues to be an acceptable, an acceptable strategy for responding to global migration. The right of the rights afforded to refugees under international law have in practice been whittled down to ensure basic physical survival. Just give them some food so they can survive. That seems to be a strategy for the past 60 years. This would be less of a problem if refugeehood was a temporary stage as originally designed, but it has evolved into a permanent status. Thus, it's evident that the durable solution mo model needed to be reinvestigated. Re the 1951 Convention and 1967 Protocol, while they put forth extremely important standards for the human rights of refugees, are outdated and unenforced, in my, in my opinion. There is also lack of accountability. This open, this open international law is accepted, and rather than being viewed as a, a significant crime, it is an offensive but un unavoidable state decision. The lack of accountability to international law should serve as a warning to alert the world of 
the failing legal and management system currently in play. The famous Simon Wiesenthal said, for evil to flourish, it only requires good men to do nothing. I'm afraid that that's what's going on at this time. So the, we keep hearing that there is a refugee crisis. That there is a crisis in Europe, there is a crisis here, there is a crisis everywhere. I have a different opinion. I disagree. We don't have a refugee crisis. I think the number one crisis we have is our response to the crisis. We are not interested to help refugees. Our inability to say, welcome, I will help you, rather than we start seeing refugees as a national security threat, a threat to our culture, a threat to our value. Therefore, we are not welcoming them. That, for me, is the crisis at this time. The, the international community was very, very pleased with the UNSCR managing refugee camps. They are willing to fund it as long as refugees are staying in that refugee camp. Our approach, our approach is fear of this ex sometimes exotic looking people. We see them as a burden to society. We often use a language of dehumanizing them. Some well-intended people believe that we have to first put them down so we can lift them up. We don't need to put down a human being so hopefully one day we can lift them up. That's not a policy of a human response. I can assure you from my personal experience, refugees are not a burden to any society. If refugees and immigrants were a burden, the US, a country of migrants and refugees, would be the poorest backward country in the world. If you don't believe me, ask the founder of Google, or perhaps when you have time, check your own family history. Refugees and immigrants have never been a burden. Here in the United States, I believe you know, ordinary people from Eastern Europe, Western Europe, from Asia, Africa, from Latin America, Central America, all ordinary people came to this land and did extraordinary things. They make America the greatest country in the world. So refugees and immigrants are not a burden. What refugees are asking is freedom, dignity, and a place to stand on. And like most of us, they deserve life, freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. Finally, there are very few simple basic rules I wanted to share we, with you to win people's hearts and make them join you in the service of others. The number one thing you have to do is love those you claim you are fighting for. Second, respect the dignity, history, and culture of the people. When possible, respect their achievement and things they cherish. Third, give them a sense of security. And fourth, 
give them hope. The rest is easy. Again, on behalf of refugees, immigrants, thank you for being the voice to the voiceless. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. My name is Marlon May, a Beloiter in heart, even though I haven't been here for 19 years. Thank you for an incredibly compelling statement tonight. You have mentioned several times about the management system of refugees. Uh, you've talked about the massive numbers of refugees. I'm not clear on what you mean by management system, and it seems to me with that many, we must be talking about management systems. And then the other part of that question would be, where do we begin to plug into systems that aren't working? Uh, first, welcome back. <laughs> See, you can't go very far from below it, I guess. <laughs> So when I say a management system, in the 1951 convention, this is after you know, 1945 in Europe, so many refugees, the idea of a camp has never been discussed because nobody wanted to have a refugee camp in Europe. Keep in mind, prior to 1945, you know, no camp existed in Africa. If I'm not mistaken, you know, in 19, for after 1945, I do not believe there was a camp in, in Asia. So nobody wants to have a camp. But after 1955, 51, when refugees start, you know, going out, out of their country, then the, the solution became, temporary solution is get them immediately, give them tents, water, food, you know, some sanitation, and then it was really, the idea was temporary until we found some solution. Well, unfortunately, that solution became 30 years, 40 years they have been waiting there. You know, keep in mind, I, I, maybe I should tell you a, a refugee camp. If you are in a refugee camp, you have no right to go to school, you have no right to work, you have no right to get out of the camp, you have to stay there day in, day out, year after year. So what we did is, you know, we give them food, you know, some grain, you know, to cook, cooking oil, and they stay there. And I remember a New York Times reporter went to a refugee camp, and he came back and said, wow, these people are really very strong, very creative people. And I was thinking, what is he talking about there? Yeah. So they have bars, you know, you know, you know, they have bars, you know, they have, you know, music in the camp. He didn't realize that refugees actually turning the grain, the, the, you know, the corn they're getting from UNHCR, they're turning it into uh, a tequila kind of drink. And I have been there, I know this. So what they are doing is rather than, since they can't afford to have Valium, they have been drinking. Because you, you need something to put you to sleep, you know. 
Because every day, you know, you wake up and there is nothing for you. So that management for me, and again, you know, every, this is my opinion, is cruel, inhumane, degrading system. Yeah. And that has to change. And that's what I consider it, uh, a refugee warehousing management. You know, when you do a warehouse, you know, you put them in blocks, you know, there's old blocks, even in every refugee can be go this way, there's some refugees right there. So we keep them there, yeah, for a long time. In 2010, I went to a refugee camp called Dadab. I met this guy, 31 years old. He came to the refugee camp alone when he was 11. And then he got married. His wife, I was actually born in the refugee camp. And now, you know, they had three children, maybe now four. They had never been to their country. His wife had never been to their country. She was born and raised in camp. So you can say, you know, that they, they, they live in prison, but they were given at least a chance to interact and perhaps to love another person. Perhaps, you know, if you get married, Maybe you get more food, maybe the ration, you know. So it become, you know, uh, a choice of survival. But I don't want to question their commitment to each other, but I understand if they do that. So that's what I meant, management. I hope I answer your Come on, you know, I know I have been talking to you guys for <laughs> every day, every hour. I, I, unfortunately, I couldn't come okay. up with a new idea. Okay. So for some of you, it's really boring, but <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, hi, that, I'm Leon, retired and tired. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> no, not say. really. I wanted to ask you, um, there's all this feeling of nationalism going around. And um, there's all this feelings of hate and what I call the politics of exclusion. Uh, I'd like to have you uh, comment on that. And I was listening to the radio the other day, and it this person, this narrator said there was a United States representative from Iowa, whose name I will not mention, said something like, foreigners will never, ever make us great. Uh, I, I think I know the person you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not that... Stupid to mention his name too, <laughs> uh, but he has been he has been saying that for many many years. Um, I think my worry is the voice of the good people, the people who welcomes people, the people who know their own history, their parents' history, the grandparents, the journey, you know, of very difficult time. You know, that voice is not really being heard. I am 100% sure, you know, the voice of love, compassion, caring one another is still here and will continue to be here. Unfortunately, you know, we have a media that focuses on, on on the challenges of every human being rather than their strengths. You know, look at the media, what are we reporting every day? You know, you know somebody killed somebody, somebody stole somebody's car, you know, somebody did this. We have no time, you know, there are so many good people. You know, all of my role models for me who came as a young person are people here. Some of them in Wisconsin. A good friend of mine who adopted three kids when they were babies. One from Khartoum, 
the other one from, I believe, Honduras. He loved his kids to death. He is my role model. He told me how to love another person, another stranger. And I can go on and go on. And my life has been reached by so many people. So unfortunately, we don't have a way, a system, unless we're lucky enough to have Beloit College, you know, convene us and, and have this discussion. So I, I, I don't really spend my time focusing on that. If I do, you know, I will be very, very uh, victim, I victimize myself. I'll tell you a story. It's a lot of successful story. 44% of new startup business in this country is started either by immigrants or, or refugee. This is from 2006 to 2000, uh, to, from 2005 to 2016, I believe. You know, I remember a congressman from Vietnam who came on. He was eight years old from India uh, and then resettled in, in India. And I think he went to the foster care system. And he ended up a congressman from Louisiana, 9th District. You know, I don't know about your politics, about the Affordable Care Act, but he was the only Republican to vote for it. Apparently, his experience and his value system didn't allow him to follow the, the, the natural, you know, uh, party affiliation decision he has to make. So there's a lot of people, you know, and I believe, you know, the leadership here, the foundation, Nina and Marvin, you know, what they did is, 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 is in my view, is a reflection of the value system. Every day we have to make that decision. You know, I always told my colleagues, you know, there is no budget. Budget is a statement of value. It's not about the numbers. Inviting somebody who's no credential uh, and you know it's refugee uh, issue from Washington here is not really a foundation decision. It is actually the value of the foundation, the the value of the leadership here. So we make all those decisions, but unfortunately we don't get the, the media because we don't do it for recognition. You know, we don't do it so somebody will say, oh, you're doing a great job. We do it because that's who we are. It's a reflection of our value and we'll continue to do that. Uh, my name is Danielle. I'm a teacher of refugee and immigrant kids, middle school kids in Rockford, which is just south of here. And my question is, how vulnerable is the United States Commission for Refugees and Immigrants in the amount of, well, with the current administration and the direction that they're taking, how vulnerable, shall we say, um, is that activity going to be? Are we uh, not just the executive order to um, to hold off, shall we say, the um, Arab nations that they don't want coming in, but is there a risk that the budget of um, the committee that you work for going to be limited and therefore not be able to serve, oops, excuse me, uh, serve as many people as it has in the past? You know, my view is, you know, when we start worrying about our institutional existence, or preserving the institution itself, then we lose. So for me, I'll be very happy to see we are out of business because no refugee is you know, existing in this world. That would be wonderful. I would be very happy a day that we don't have to talk about refugees and we don't have refugees. And I would love to see my organization, as you said, we did a good job. Let's go to another one. So I worry when people always say, oh, are you, is your budget going to be impacted? Or, you know, what's going to happen? The government is going to give you less money. Yeah, it's going to happen. But 
I care more about the people. The day we allow another refugee to stay in refugee camp is a day, it's a wasted day for me. So my worry at this time, not the institution, yes, as part of the man, senior management team, I have to make sure that I pay the payroll, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, what matters to me is whether one refugee who needs to be here and start a new life is now still you know, languishing in a refugee camp. So that's really the struggle. You know, it's, you know, so I, I wanted to make sure people, people understand, you know, there is no organization that I know started this work because somebody is giving them money. My organization started in 1911. From what I gather, they did not receive a dime from the government until 1978. I know, I know an organization in, in New York called the International Rescue Committee. It was founded by Albert Einstein in 1933. I know 100% I used to work with them. They, they didn't get a government money until the 1978 when the government decided after the Vietnam War to resettle thousands of refugees. And I know Catholic ch charities have been serving refugees, I would say maybe for about 2,000 years. <laughs> I don't think there was any government funding. So, but sometimes, you know, people say, oh, you know, you're funding this. I really don't want to have any discussion about it. As long as there are good people, who, people who care, I know will continue to serve. The day people stop caring about another human being, then we'll be out of business. And that's the way I see it. Um, based on what you've just said, it seems you're suggesting a little bit that it's about what we as individuals do more than kind of a, a government-driven or top-down process. So I'm wondering if you're appealing more toward individual citizens, especially of wealthier nations, to kind of be more welcoming or have a change of heart, or whether you think there need to be new agreements on resettlement and moving people out of camps. You know, what's the role of government versus individuals in driving this? Uh, how much is it a bottom-up process and how much should it be a top-down process to fix it? Well, you know, the, uh, I, I personally like uh, a non-governmental approach to humanitarian response. It's just my view. Because it's like a, the old story, you know. Uh, ever since the Trojan, the Greeks who rec received the Trojan horse, it's a very hazardous business actually to get money from the government. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, I believe that there is some freedom when you are free from the government uh, doing your humanitarian work. Um, having said that, if the governments also value the human dignity then they will be willing, again, when making that value judgment, whether to help or not to help. I'm not really asking any nation to give money to anybody. I'm just simply saying, when you see a refugee, try to see yourselves with them. You know, they will never be a burden to you because you are not a burden to anybody. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually trying to go through a humanitarian approach that is under legalities, you know, international law, and which I am not an expert. Um, maybe Betsy knows more about this than I do. So my, my, you know, keep in mind, in 1939, we had Polish refugees from Poland went all the way to Iran for protection. In 1945, we had refugee camps, guess what, in Aleppo, Syria. You know. So we are always, migration always happened. You know, we 
always are moving from one place to another place. Again, in terms, you know, in the old days, they used to fight them. You know, uh, you know, some countries decided to build, you know, a wall. They don't want a, a fence. You know, my argument has been, you know, the Chinese tried it. They built a wall. It, it didn't protect them from the Mongolians. <laughs> So that's, that's really what I'm saying is we, as citizens, we make the decision, you know. It's our decision whether it's worth saving another human life. If we go through a different business route and we start putting a cost-benefit analysis of how much would it cost to help another human being, we'll always be in deficit. But if we decide the cost of saving another person is important, there is always a surplus. And that's my approach. Um, in as much as there are some of these camps that have been around for 50 years, are there any examples of the camp themselves coming up with their own businesses, being allowed to have businesses to somehow bootstrap themselves up? Um, I, I know that probably isn't a, a viable solution for 65 million of, of, of the people, but I would think in certain circumstances that might be the only way to get rid of the camp. Yeah, I, the, uh, yeah, some people, you know, in fact, it was so funny, you know, the camp is a controlled camp. So every time I go, I see businesses near the camp, <laughs> and people coming to sell something to refugees inside, you know. Uh, cigarettes is probably the number one thing I have seen. Um, I think, you know, the question is, if, the, the country decide, you know, if, if I'm a country and, and, and if I have refugees, my theory will be give them some kind of legal status. There is no requirement that you have to give them citizenship. Give them some legal status so they can work, you know, go to school at their own cost if necessary or, or again, help. And then they probably pay back to the host country. You know, but if you just put them in a cage and then without any rights whatsoever, there's no business to create there. That's why you see a lot of businesses these days out of refugee camp. You know what the number one business in refugee camp? Does anybody know? Human trafficking. You know, kidnapping young girls and boys when they go, you know, to get water or 